Good morning. Good morning. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI's Vice President, and it is uh, a real pleasure to welcome everyone here to this very special event, Geneva Peace Week meets New York, building trust, building peace. I love the, uh, we've got covers on the, on the seats. That's the first time for IPI. It looks great. Um, Really want to just start off very briefly by uh, thanking the uh, government of Switzerland and the Geneva Peace Building Platform, who are really the driving force uh, behind this event. It's been in the works for quite some time, so it's really great to see everybody here. For IPI, this is uh, part of our uh, general commitment to do a better job of bridging the conversations in Geneva and New York um, as the multilateral system is increasingly challenged and a whole of system response is clearly needed, it is more and more important to bridge conversations between New York and Geneva, between the New York peace and security architecture and the, multi, uh, the institutions of Geneva and civil society based in Geneva. And this is part of that. Uh, work commitment for IPI, which is a stated priority for IPI in 2023 and beyond. Uh, in that spirit, we will be today looking back on Geneva Peace Week and forward to the Summit of the Future in New York and beyond to the 2025 Peace uh, Building Architecture Review. We've got a day and a half of panels, so stick with us. Uh, it's really a, a really exciting program. We've got panels uh, on the new agenda for peace we'll be discussing, uh, AI, new technologies, human rights, uh, climate and beyond. Uh, so really uh, stay with us. We'll be broadcasting online and in this room and we welcome you uh, to come back and forth if you have meetings in between, but it's, uh, it's gonna be a very, very rich discussion. Um, and that, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our partner, Anissa Bilal, Executive Director of the Geneva, Geneva Peace Building Platform. It is really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, in New York, we've been uh, working together in Geneva quite a bit recently, uh, and it's always really a pleasure uh, to see you. Anissa, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed a great <coughs> pleasure for the Geneva Peace Building Platform to be here today. We are the Geneva Peace Building Platform. is It's just a platform where we collaborate with uh, different institutions, our core partners, DCAF, uh, Geneva Center for Security Policy, Principle for Peace, the Graduate Institute, and CUNO. And all our partners are here um, to, to discuss uh, with the New York community on this uh, very important issue. Um, as Adam uh, has said, um, we are moving towards a new global order, and this is quite clear. Um, over the past decade, there has been progress in science, in technology, and economic development, and those have greatly benefited peace-building work. Nevertheless, our world remains fragile and plagued by internal violence and armed conflict of far-reaching geopolitical dimensions, and we have all been um, uh, testifying of, uh, we have all been a witness of these uh, dimensions. And this increases the fragmentation and polarization of, the, of our current system. As UN member states are preparing for the summit of the future, um, we are guided by a new agenda for peace, and it is crucial to ask how we can restore trust between member states in our institutions and the multilateral system and how to counter uh, divisive narratives. To discuss all of these uh, challenges and issues, we have here a stellar panel um, of high-level uh, speakers. I will introduce uh, them uh, by their function, and you have at your disposal their complete biographies um, uh, if you are uh, interested to read more about them. The first uh, speaker will be uh, Her Excellency Pascal Beresville. You are the permanent representative of Switzerland to the United Nations. Please. Thank you very much, um, Anissa and Adam. And let me begin by thanking the host, um, Yazaid and IPI, uh, for having the peace building community here on this occasion of the Geneva Peace Week meets New York. This day and a half of discussions constitutes for us a new iteration of the Geneva Peace Week, which over the past decade has developed into a leading, powerful and influential moment on the annual multilateral calendar for peace. So enhancing cooperation between Geneva and New York has long been a key priority for, for my government, Switzerland, and such a priority 
remains, of course, as relevant as ever as we conclude the first year of our RAS historical membership uh, to the United Nations Security Council. 2023 has indeed been characterized by the entrenching of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the eruption of hostilities in Sudan, the withdrawal of several peacekeeping missions in Africa at the request of the countries concerned, as well as since early October, renewed horrific hostilities in the Middle East, whose unbearable consequences on the civilian population will be felt for years, if not decades to come, and brings us also to a breaking point. So in other words, um, it is a challenging time for peace builders and, um, and difficult to um, just be positive and anyone um, amplifying the voices of peace um, has really a hard job at the moment. It's therefore heartening to know that more than 3,000 people, in addition to 2,600 online, more than ever before participated in the 2023 Geneva Peace Week and to see so many of you here today. And I would like to thank you all for coming, for joining and for um, giving uh, your thoughts and creativity to uh, find new ways forward. With this event, we aim at sketching answers to the unease uh, which is upon us and to the questions that many of us too regularly ask ourselves, what does the future of multilateralism actually look like? What should it look like? How can one rebuild trust in a world increasingly divided uh, by com compounded inequalities and geopolitical tensions? And I can tell you, we can feel that on a daily basis in the Security Council. How can one tangibly promote peace while conflicts become entrenched. And we were looking at the Security Council agenda. There is only one conflict, Colombia, which somehow is on a good path. And in all the other geographical situations, we saw a worsening of the situations um, <clears throat> throughout the year. Years of efforts towards prevention seem futile. The impacts of climate change have never been clearer and we don't spend enough time talking about it. And the humanitarian community is left to pick up the pieces often reaching the limits of its own budgetary and mandate related capabilities. Um, so somehow, if we don't find political solutions, we just um, hand it over to the humanitarians. Now is, it's the time to engage in strategic analysis, to share lessons learned and good practices and to establish new partnerships in order, in order to ultimately rebuild trust, the trust that was broken and pave the way forward for sustainable peace not least in view of the summit of the future and with the new agenda for peace in mind. As emphasized by Volker Turk, the High Commissioner for Human Rights during the open debate we organized in May on trust, I quote, trust no doubt is the foundation of conflict prevention and of sustainable peace. Such diagnosis was equally shared by the UN Secretary General in his new agenda for peace who concluded that, I, I, I quote, in a world of sovereign states, international cooperation is predicated upon trust. <clears throat> so now more than ever, it is time to purposefully and consciously think of, talk about and promote peace building based on renewed trust amongst all stakeholders of the multilateral system, as well as between national authorities and their constituencies. For, for there are examples like that of Colombia I mentioned of prevention and of conflict resolution instruments having yielded concrete positive results. The Geneva Peace Week meets New York provides us with a unique opportunity to do so. We know one thing for sure, when the violence of an armed conflict ceases, and it eventually does, it becomes clear that there is no alternative to building a sustainable, lasting and just peace. It equally becomes clear that actions towards prevention, peaceful resolution of conflict and dealing with the past constitute a far smarter investment in the future than risking once again to bear the terrible brunt of armed conflict. In other words, the purpose of and tools enshrined in the UN Charter, outlawing resort to armed force between states in order to safeguard mankind from a hell like World War II, remain as relevant as ever. For their author's time was sadly not very different from ours, a global rise in nationalism, increased polarization on the world stage, economic crisis and warfare. Even if, if they lived in a completely different world, there were some of the challenges which sounded very similar to uh, today. 
in order to face these complex challenges and be worthy of our collective responsibility, one requires insights into areas as diverse as human rights, climate-related issues, new technologies such as artificial intelligence, health, disarmament, mediation, or global and or local trade. Switzerland is therefore convinced that leveraging complementarities between Geneva and New York will allow us, each of us, and the multilateral system as a whole to not only acquire the necessary skills, but also reinforce our collective trust. In that perspective, allow me to elaborate on a few opportunities for enhanced cooperation between these two UN hubs. First, reaffirming the continuous relevance of the UN Charter and other rules of international law, such as IHL and IHRL, with the purpose of recreating trust and ultimately building sustainable peace. And I always say there is many more parts of the Charter we all agree upon than parts we are divided uh, about. Second, providing a safe space, adequate platform for consulting all relevant stakeholders, including civil society, and thus feed into New York-based processes on peace building. And finally, universalizing prevention through national strategies as called for in the new agenda for peace and leveraging the work of Geneva-based institutions and processes such as the OHCHR and the UPR for that purpose. Last and certainly not least, taking advantage of initiatives such as the Geneva Peace Week meets New York, jointly led by the Geneva Peace Building Platform and the International Peace Institute. I'm convinced that the following day and a half will enable all of you participants to engage in a reflective, genuine, productive, creative, and trusting dialogue, thus allowing for the identification of concrete means for further collaboration between Geneva and New York on peace building. And I look forward to seeing it come to fruition in the coming months. And I'm also curious to hear what we could do in the Security Council to integrate your ideas. On that hopeful and studious note, I would like to express my deep gratitude to the GPP and IPI for making such an event possible and wish you all successful discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Beresville. Uh, our next speaker is Zaid Rad Al Hussein. You are the president and CEO of IPI. Uh, thank you, Anisha. Good morning, everyone. Um, I too am delighted to be joining uh, Geneva, the Geneva Peace Building uh, Foundation and or platform, sorry, and uh, the Switzerland, the government of Switzerland, or the Swiss uh, permanent mission here. And delighted to to have um, the person of. Uh, Pascal Bereswell, the ambassador and permanent representative with us. Uh, I say so from an institutional point of view, but also from a personal point of view, because I haven't been a panelist at IPI for five years. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who runs this place, but I've been denied that. And so now for the first time, I can sit and, and let loose a little bit. So um, this is a continuation of a very important week uh, on the 30th that began the 30th of October. Uh, in uh, Geneva, Gene the, 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 the latest uh, discussions that we had, the series of discussions for Geneva Peace Week, were shadowed, as uh, Pascal was saying, by the events in Gaza. Uh, the proximate cause was the horrific attack by Hamas on, on perpetrated by Hamas on the 7th of October, um, and uh, which must be condemned unequivocally. And uh, it was so reminiscent, was it, of the work of the uh, the horrific work of the Einsatzgruppen in 1941 in Ukraine and eastern uh, the eastern part of Europe, um, the response uh, outrageously disproportionate and unprecedented uh, by the government of Israel, and together with the initial attack, both must be seen as being in the front rank of uh, those atrocities that could ever be committed by humankind. And against a backdrop of 56 years of uh, military occupation and a 16-year blockade, the Middle East lies as an open wound uh, where peace and finding peace becomes prime, uh, let uh, alone all the other crises we have from Ukraine, Sudan, Myanmar, and the list is long and sad. Um, between now and the summit for the future, is it not possible, therefore, to take uh, the a new agenda for peace and see whether or not 
we can take or use the crisis in Gaza as an example for how we can make the new agenda work, actually function, uh, put words into actions. So one of the principal points was uh, to prevent uh, conflict at a global level. We must be accurate in assessing strategic risks. When looking at the crisis in Gaza, it doesn't take a genius to understand that were a uh, confrontation to really balloon in the West Bank and then migrate to Jerusalem, we enter a new dimension of the crisis. So uh, if we are to assume that the pause will be a pause and not a ceasefire, and then a cessation of hostilities and fighting commences, the risks on the West Bank are very, very high. And then you suddenly see how this could mutate into a conflict between ultimately two nuclear powers, potentially Iran, depending on how you assess their nuclear capability, and Israel on the other side. So Kofi Annan had conceived of the quartet as a modulating, mediating mechanism. That obviously is dead. What now can the UN do to find a replacement? What in, it, in, in actual terms could be put into place? Another function or another issue that emerged in New Agenda for Peace when it comes to sustaining peace is the role of human rights. And here uh, there are um, so many uh, atrocity crimes that are alleged and suspected of having been committed. The question will be, what are the member states going to do about accountability? What additional support can they give to the International Criminal Court? What additional assurances can they give that if there are those to be, or there are those who will ultimately be in, indicted, would there be cooperation from the state parties to the Rome Statute? Are they willing to surrender those who may be suspected of committing crimes on both sides? Uh, on sustaining peace, women, peace and security is an issue which I think all of us on this panel uh, take extremely seriously. And I think what's most interesting is that uh, soon emerging from CEDAW, we have General Comment 40, which will transform the way we understand the issue of presence, women's presence. And, and this must be incorporated into our understandings of peace. And General Comment 40 will emerge from Geneva and must be blended into our understanding of this. And this certainly has a role where uh, the Middle East is concerned and where the fighting in Gaza will have to then move into some other dimension. And so it'll be interesting to see what the UN can do before summit for the future on this issue. Um, finally, most of my career was spent in New York, my diplomatic career, but I think a critical part of it was in Geneva. And I always felt, um, having experienced my uh, Geneva International or UN Geneva, that Geneva was far more authentically the UN. Uh, it, was, it was more the, what the UN should always have been. Uh, New York UN, there are too many distortions, too many deviations from the norm, from the UN Charter, as Ambassador Bereswell has just said. And, and there's so much that doesn't sort of fit. You know, why is it that when we speak of the SDGs, there isn't a single uh, resident coordinator, to my knowledge, present in any of the OECD countries? You know, and let alone the, the lack of a visible presence at the SDG summit uh, at the head of state level back in September. It's sort of, this is a distortion away from the norm and that has to be changed. And, and so the argument of bringing Geneva to New York is a powerful one. Um, and I think finally on the, on the human rights issue, um, and this is a point that was raised on by Ambassador Bearswell. It, so long as New York is selective in where it applies the pressure and it's not fair and firm, whether this is both the Secretariat and the member states, right? So we see what happens in the third committee on the human rights uh, items. So long as you're not telling the truth to everyone, to all member states, double standards will remain the bile and the poison of the UN. Everyone practices it and it will remain that. It's only the independent bodies connected to human rights, special rapporteurs, OHCHR, that really take a fair line down the middle. 
if you're going to build trust, you must have a referee, trust between member states, a referee that calls out everyone fairly and firmly. And then you need a mediating sort of function to create and build what is seen as a dispute over the facts. And that mediation function has largely disappeared from New York. It's very present in Geneva. And that's another reason why Geneva needs to come to New York. It needs to be rebuilt in New York. Um, and then my last two points, our conception of peace must also be broader. I agree completely with Ambassador Bay as well. I, I said it 10 years ago in the Security Council. The UN needs a, a historical support service. It needs a support service uh, where governments can be advised how to sort out the historical narratives. History is not a dispute without end. Uh, history, many of the central lines are settled, but the details, some of the details are in dispute. And the UN needs that function if it's going to take a preventive lens. And then uh, finally, we at IPI are also working with WHO on bridging health and peace together. And this is another area which we think is central. It's not in the agenda for peace, but we feel it needs to be mentioned and spoken about uh, as uh, an additional point. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Zaid. Um, our next speaker is His Excellency Ivan Simonovic, uh, the permanent representative of Croatia to the UN. Um, thank you, Madam Moderator. I'm really help, happy to uh, participate in this event because I do think that, as Adam mentioned, we need bridges. In the UN, we must be working more together, and it's along different lines. In, it's Geneva and New York. It's uh, headquarters and field. It's uh, government uh, as well as uh, civil society. It's particularly important now in uh, challenging circumstances that you have described. When I was uh, recently uh, having a lecture at Columbia, uh, one student asked me, uh, in the UN, are you pessimists or optimists? <laughs> So I said, well, there are some pessimists and there are some optimists. Pessimists think that we will be soon destroyed by weapons of mass destruction, while optimists think that we will survive long enough to be destroyed by climate change. <laughs> uh, however, uh, there are, uh, despite uh, challenges, some opportunities, and I do think uh, that New Agenda for Peace is indicating some opportunities uh, that we need to transform some ideas of New Agenda for Peace into practical activities and discuss them uh, in order for them to be part of the summit of the future. And some of them could also inspire uh, the uh, peace building uh, review in uh, 25. Now, uh, I will exactly focus uh, on this area and those interrelationship, but from a specific angle, from a specific angle of uh, peace building commission uh, that Croatia is chairing this year. So structure of my presentation is uh, main ideas of new agenda for peace. What practical activities uh, could be introduced and finally, what should be the role of PBC in, uh, uh, in helping those uh, activities to materialize? Of course, I can just sketch it briefly uh, within uh, the time at my disposal. So what are the main ideas? I totally agree with the concept note that we should single out building trust and prevention. Now, let me start with building trust. In a uh, new agenda for peace, uh, one element that I would like to single out, important for building trust, is a strengthening relationship between United Nations and regional organizations. And uh, I have an idea how that could be transformed into some uh, 
practical activity. Uh, this is a sustainable peace network consisting of peace uh, building commission as well uh, as a relevant regional counterpart. Uh, so I uh, just returned uh, uh, from meetings uh, 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 at AU headquarters and all relevant uh, uh, interlocutors, including uh, chair uh, of uh, AU, including uh, African Union, Peace and Security Council, agreed that uh, practical action can be taken in this regard. So how would it look like? For example, uh, when PBC is giving its advice uh, to Security Council or General Assembly, it should consult ahead with the African Union as well as some regional economic commissions. Uh, and they should also be invited uh, by PBC when discussing African issues. So what PBC gets out of it is uh, a well-informed advice on uh, uh, our uh, recommendations and in formulating them. And uh, our regional partners are getting an additional channel for uh, 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 communicating their ideas, especially important uh, to uh, the uh, Security Council. L let me move now to prevention, and let me divide structural prevention and operational prevention. Uh, I think that uh, New Agenda for Peace mentioned very, very important two dimensions of structural prevention. One of them is universality of prevention. Uh, there isn't a single country <laughs> that cannot further improve uh, its prevention. And secondly, it's the idea of encouraging countries or potentially regions to develop their national or regional prevention strategies. So how could that improve uh, prevention and what could be role of PBC in this regard? I hope that already next month we will be able to demonstrate it in practice where we will be having two to three countries uh, which will be sharing uh, their national prevention strategies. Uh, for some countries that have uh, well-developed and uh, implemented national strategies, uh, it's an opportunity to share with other countries uh, successful strategies uh, for uh, the sake of examples of good practice. But it's also important to have opportunity to have countries that know what should be effective prevention strategy for them, but do not have means to implement it. So I hope that I will have also high level participation of World Bank at that meeting, which could uh, support uh, financially uh, the uh, implementation of strategies for countries that need uh, such a support. I discussed that in Washington and uh, reactions uh, were uh, positive. Now, uh, this is just a one event, but why not to go further? Why not use the model of voluntary national reviews and transform PBC as forum, which can be a shop window for countries to discuss their national prevention strategies? Or could we be even more ambitious and think about the model of universal periodic review, uh, this time not in the area of human rights, but in the areas of uh, prevention strategies. And now finally, let me move uh, to operational, uh, operational prevention. I think we can make a, a, a relatively easy, important improvement in two aspects. First is we need uh, uh, more smooth transitions uh, from uh, large peacekeeping operations uh, to uh, the regular uh, work of country teams. Uh, second area is, in addition uh, to post-conflict peace building, uh, is also 
prevention of conflicts when we see that situation is certain uh, uh, in certain countries or regions uh, are deteriorating. Now, uh, the solutions to that I see in uh, light footprint missions. And uh, Zaid, you may remember that in time of human rights up front, uh, we were arguing in favor of that ideas of small, entirely civilian uh, uh, missions that would be deployed uh, to prevent conflicts consisting uh, of some human rights officers, consisting on uh, building rule of law experts, consisting of uh, some, uh, some political affairs uh, officers. Uh, I think that along the model of PBC, uh, they could be deployed upon request of states. So they are not imposed. Of course, uh, the question is, why would countries want uh, to have such missions? If those missions would be having financial muscle to be able to address root causes of instability, at least some countries would be willing and motivated uh, to host them. Uh, what would be the motive uh, to finance such missions? Uh, the motive uh, to finance such missions would be uh, in uh, transitions from robust peacekeeping that uh, the uh, robust, expensive peacekeeping could last shorter if it's fo followed up by light footprint missions. In sense of those, uh, that other aspect of prevention, uh, we all know that investments in prevention from medicine to security are uh, financially uh, really paying off. Uh, and what is the role of PBC? Well, uh, hypothetically, PBC could be a body uh, which would be in charge of such missions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Simonovic, for these inspiring and very concrete recommendations. Um, our last speaker is Ambassador Nathalie Chouard. She's the director of DCAV, the Geneva Center of Security Sector Governance. Please, Nathalie. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. It's a real honor to be here with my fellow panelists and uh, with all, all of you. It reminds me also of all the time I spent at IPI when I was at the Mission of Switzerland a few years back. Um, I'm very delighted to, to participate in this uh, uh, Geneva Peace Week uh, meets New York. And it was uh, last month when we took this uh, edition, when we had the edition in, in Geneva, it was really a message of hope that came out of of, uh, the discussion in Geneva. And I also uh, really wish that this edition proves to be equally enriching and, and hopeful. Uh, we all want peace and uh, building peace is really a core priority for, for all of us. And the time we are living makes all that clear. And I think all the fellow panelists said it before that uh, the unacceptable human suffering that is caused by uh, the loss of peace. And as actors of uh, peace building, we are now facing increasing challenges and uh, saying a few things about operating in shrinking democratic space and at a time when our multilateral system is being tested. However, and I, I really said it earlier, the overall message from the Geneva Peace Week was one of hope. And that's really the one I also want to bring to New York today. And there is still so much we can do to promote peace. And this starts very often with the effort that we have on the ground to build trust as a foundation for peace. And that's where perhaps I want to uh, give you our perspective from, from DCAF, but also really from this field experience, as many elements are also illustrative uh, beyond our own work or our own, own sector. First, on the social contract. Uh, while uh, both the U UN Common Agenda and the New Agenda for Peace underscore the need to invest in renewing the social contract, there is one pathway that is often overlooked, and that is the engagement with the security sector. And in general, the first interaction that people experience uh, with the state is with security and justice actors. And deficit in service delivery, whether they are really real or perceived, contribute to undermining trust and create grievances. 
And these can feed into conflict and violence. So taking a social uh, contract lens to our work requires a focus on service delivery for the people. And our effort to strengthen the institution only matter if they deliver real benefit for communities on the ground. It is about a change that people can feel in their lives. So with the objective of contributing to reflection on, on uh, in the run-up to the summit of the future, we recently had an important discussion at uh, Palais des Nations in, in Geneva. And we underlined there how a poorly governed security sector, which contributes to the margin marginalization of segments of the society, or fails to protect their human rights, will fuel grievances and can evolve into violent conflict. On the contrary, the act of delivering security and justice for all, regardless of ethnicity, gender, or religion, can significantly contribute to perception of inclusion, equality, and justice, and provide the foundation for strengthening the social contract. In brief, trust in the ability of institutions to deliver services is crucial. And in Geneva, obviously, the human rights angle was very present. And in this regard, it is equally important to protect the human rights of communities, as well as of security sector personnel, to incentivize the sector to break cycle of distrust with the population. So building trust and preventing violent conflict requires investing in the good governance of the security sector. And indeed, this sector needs a, to be perceived as an internal part, integral part of the public administration, a public good subject to the same principle and standards of good governance as any other component and operating in line with the principle of human rights and the rule of law. It is about building a countable institution. And we heard about the SDGs earlier. And we know that countries with higher levels of trust in public institutions are more resilient and better equipped to face challenges. That brings me to my second point. When talking about governance, we also must be clear about what it means. And this is about effectiveness, accountability, and inclusion. And if security sector is not effective, it cannot protect the population and it can undermine state legitimacy. If the actors are not accountable, they are likely to engage in corrupt behavior, which undermines trust and undermine human rights. No, seen from a prevention lens, we absolutely need to focus more on promoting the principle of inclusion in a meaningful manner. And in DCAF experience, the inclusion of all, women, yours, or different minority group, is not just about equal access to security delivery, but also equal opportunities to join the sector. And a security sector that mirrors the society is likely to be better considered and better tool to respond to complex challenges. We spoke already about women, peace, and security. And since we are marking the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, I want here to underline how gender equality in the security sector is crucial from promoting meaningful participation of women in peacekeeping operation to addressing violence and inequalities in their daily lives. Participation allows for a shared vision of the future, a vision that helps strengthen social cohesion. And civil society organizations play a vital role in this regard. National ownership is indeed more than government empowerment. The civil society can be a channel between the government and the people, and then voices need to be heard. So what does this mean for the new agenda for peace and the summit of the future? We need to reflect on how to better design and better measure our effort to build peace. During the Geneva Peace Week, our accountability as peace builder was also highlighted. We should ensure that we are doing is indeed addressing underlying perception of injustice, inequality, and exclusion. Additionally, if the idea of national prevention strategies that was already mentioned by Ambassador Simonovic uh, that are really uh, outlined in the new agenda for peace gain traction, which we hope and encourage, then we should be working hard on how to promote them and also make accountability part of the discussion. We need improved assessment tool to help us identify root causes as well as resilience factor. And when it comes to the institutional level, 
any such assessment must include proper benchmark of good governance of the public sector. We must do more to support our partners on the ground to put good governance at the heart of our efforts. A governance that is based on equality in law. And that brings me to my closing and back to our talks in Geneva. One key element we established, and that was again mentioned this morning, is the necessity to build the basic principle of international law and human rights to put them front and center to our effort. And safeguarding this principle and applying them with consistency is essential. And every time this is not the case or that the norms are distorted, as you put further, um, Said, we are reminded of that every day right now. Civilians are paying the heaviest price. It is therefore time to be serious and to put the people first. Thank you very much, Ambassador Shuar, for these uh, very enlightening and concluding remarks of this panel. Um, so allow me to uh, thank our panelists. And with this, we'll go to our next session. Thank you very much. Before we are going into our next sessions, now we are going to show you a very small video as a form of introduction to the Geneva Peace Week. Geneva is a laboratory to test out certain things, especially when it comes to peace. The Swiss recipe is first inclusion, second norms, and third is data. This is key for us to build, rebuild trust in a fractured world. Diplomacy is necessary. I think countries like Switzerland, which have a reputation for neutrality, that have potentially the capacity to speak in ways that are not perceived as very biased, as very extractive, can play a really important role. So it's great to be here at Geneva Peace Week. assez impressionnante, des échanges avec des participants vraiment de très haute qualité. Et je dois dire que j'étais étonnée par euh, l'aspect direct et franc de ces échanges. This is the ideal framework to launch the Geneva Compact on Artificial Intelligence, contributing to making peace possible now and in the future. We should talk about peace every day of the year and not closing a week. So please commit to peace wherever you are, whatever you do. I'm looking very much forward to seeing you again in 2024, but in the meantime, do your job. We thought that this video was a, a, a good introduction to the Geneva Peace Week. What is the Geneva Peace Week? I won't be talking um, too long about this. In the room, you have uh, Professor Keith Cross, Keith Cross from the Graduate Institute um, in Geneva, who was really at the origin of uh, the Geneva Peace Building Platform and the Geneva Peace Week. So if you want to have more information about this, please uh, go to him. But before that, uh, just to tell you that the Geneva Peace Week is indeed um, an annual forum in Geneva that uh, celebrated this year its 10th anniversary. It's not a forum where uh, high level politicians will come or head of states. It's really a forum about and for practitioners uh, from persons, peace builders that come either from the field or from different international organizations will discuss concrete recommendations and concrete um, issues uh, relating to their world, uh, to their work um, in the field or in Geneva. Um, it has been growing ever since uh, it was created. Just to give you an idea, in 2014, there were only 10 events uh, being organized at Geneva Peace Week. In 2023, we had 64 events, uh, including 19 digital series. Uh, we had 150 partners organizations, and we had uh, more than 5,000 persons participating during Geneva Peace Week. The overarching theme of this year's edition was building trust, building peace, an agenda for the future. So you can see how we 
chose the same theme for this shorter edition uh, in Geneva Peace Week meets New York. Indeed, in Geneva, the Geneva Peace Week uh, takes place for one entire week. Here, we, we couldn't reciprocate this and we concentrated all the themes in one day and a half. Um, Alongside experts and peace builders, we have also high profile speakers that were coming from New York uh, to introduce and speak during Geneva Peace Week. We had uh, the Assistant Secretary General Elizabeth Spihar for peace building support, Elizabeth Spihar, who came also uh, to uh, consolidate uh, this uh, this uh, bridge this um, this relationship between Geneva and New York we had different um, we had different high level representatives we also had um, Prince uh, Al Hussein here Zaid uh, who also um, spoke to us and reinforced this link between Geneva and New York and at the end of the the peace week we had the um, high commissioner uh, for refugees Filippo Grandi so that was really for me a short introduction to show you what we do uh, in Geneva and we are looking forward to create the same kind of discussions level of high level discussions we had in Geneva substantive discussion and not political discussion this is what makes the value of of Geneva um, uh, I think during uh, Geneva Peace Week so with that uh, I will um, join um, Adam day on 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 the on the panel so we, we were very lucky to have Dr. Adam Day, who is the head of UNU uh, in Geneva, um, to be the Geneva Peace Week reporter. And his role was indeed to a uh, very difficult role and responsibility, have a responsibility to bring the core of the discussions and the policy recommendations that were uh, gathered during Geneva Peace Week to present them to you here in New York. Please, Adam. Thanks so much, Anissa. And, and our, our office in Geneva has as its core mandate to help connect Geneva to New York. So thank you to IPI and, and GPP for doing that work for us. It's great. Um, and, and my role is, is meant to be to report back on Geneva Peace Week. Um, but I think just summarizing, it would be a little bit boring. And with um, about half of this room enduring jet lag, we can't afford to be boring. Um, and so what I'd like to do actually is try to make an argument for why the Geneva ecosystem can contribute to peace and security here based on some of the findings that came out of Geneva Peace Week. And, and really to try and make a pitch for what I think Adam Upel and Ambassador Beresfield and Ambassador Simonovich referred to as a bridge um, and, and how what that bridge could look like. So my, my pitch has, five, maybe five and a half parts, depending on how the first five go. Um, the first one is, is Geneva's operational focus, it means that it's uniquely placed to support bottom-up and locally oriented peace work. And I, I noticed this actually when, when Gaza kicked off, Geneva emptied out because everyone ran to where the problem was. And my experience of working in New York for 10 years is when the, when the crisis hits, everyone runs to their talking points at their desk. Um, and agencies like UNHCR and IOM and OHCHR and ICRC are very decentralized and field focused um, and are constantly generating new actual experiences from the field level. And we saw this in Geneva Peace Week this year. There were many sessions focused on local ownership and inclusion and partnerships, but based on actual experiences of people working in those areas. And, and I think that this kind of focus on the field is really second nature to most Geneva-based actors, especially humanitarian actors, but also others. And I think this gets also to Ambassador Simonovich's points about regional partnerships. There are a lot of examples from Geneva Peace Week. Sorry, I need to get some water. No, 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 um, jet lag is real for me too. Um, how Geneva-based actors really invested and in acting through regional organizations. So I think that first contribution from Geneva Peace Week is that experiential one that Geneva can offer practical examples of regional and local partnerships. Thanks so much. Um, and I th actually think that Ambassador Simonovich's innovative ideas around peace building just now um, are very much aligned with that too and that experience that we saw in Geneva Peace Week. It's some of the key themes in the Summit of the Future and the new agenda for peace about strengthening regional and local partnerships. And I think it, it also gets to what, what Zaid was saying about putting words into action. We saw a lot more reference to action than words in many of the, the sessions in, in Geneva. And I think it's also an example of what Ambassador Simonovich called operational prevention. Um, 
in his comments. I think the second one is Geneva's very strong technology focus. This was mentioned in the video, actually. Um, and it really places it on the cutting edge of a lot of the peace and security issues we see today. So that could be AI-driven weapons, the risks of artificial general intelligence, how technologies are being used to combat climate change, or the convergence of tech with biological sciences. And I think Geneva has a unique set of actors to contribute to that. And that includes the, the ones we all know, the, the, the UN ones, ITU and UNIDIR and the Biological Weapons Conventions, but also a lot of other tech actors that have been supported by the Swiss. And you've got JESDA, the Geneva Science Diplomacy Anticipator. You've got Diplo Foundation, the Simon Institute for Long-Term Governance, Carnegie Climate Commission, the WEF, lots of private actors working in that. And, and there was reference to one of the, the AI sessions in this video, but I think this year's Geneva Peace Week had a lot of examples of real expert discussions on tech, questions around AI governance that are also located here with the tech envoy, issues around misinformation and systemic risks. And I think that that expertise could really be brought to New York um, and to create quite a bit more dynamism um, around some of these issues around digital space, but also the role of, of technology and peace. The third one, um, was referred to, I think, by all of the speakers, which is the, the normative and standard driving aspects of, of Geneva. Obviously, the IHL and, and human rights law is one. Um, Ambassador Beresfield referred to these in her comments. So you've got the, the ones everybody knows, like OHCHR and ICRC and the Geneva Academy. And I think at a time when our peace and security realm is really dominated by serious violations of international law and acts of aggression, reprisals, disproportionate responses, Geneva could play an even more important normative role and, and push for some of that accountability that Natalie and Zaid were talking about in their comments, and a bit of that referee function that, that, Zaid, that Zaid mentioned. And I think in this year's GPW, there were several events that actually offered some really tangible ways to connect that normative side of things with New York a bit better. I'll do a little self-promotion. We did a, a, a joint paper with the Geneva Academy that offered a dozen ways to connect the Human Rights Council better with the peace and security work here in New York. There were lots of others that you should all check out too. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this really aligns with the new agenda for peace and those principles that are in the new agenda for peace around trust and universality and inclusion. And I think Geneva can play a really important role in driving and upholding some of those principles and, and certainly um, when I was listening to Ambassador Simonovich's innovative ideas around a kind of universal periodic review idea for prevention, that's a really interesting one. And that idea exists mainly in Geneva now to so learn from that experience. I was thinking that Florence Foster, who uh, has been working on this issue for the Quaker office, would have a lot to say about the, that idea. And I was just thinking that's already a connection between Geneva and a New York idea um, there. Fourth, um, is really that Geneva is actually where a lot of the work on inequality and sustainable development is actually happening. And um, this is what Ambassador Simonovich referred to as structural prevention. I think it's worth noting that this is the five-year anniversary of the UN World Bank Pathways Report that really identified most clearly that, that inequality, horizontal inequality across groups is the main driver of conflict. And so if that's true, if you believe that, and I do, um, it means that our work needs to more directly target inequalities as that driver of conflict. And if you think about it, you've got different kinds of inequalities that are addressed um, by many of the agencies in Geneva. So if you've got um, poor human rights compliance and the, and the kind of grievances that arise from that, you've got OHCHR. If you've got unfair distribution of livelihoods, you've got ILO, SDG Hub, and, and others in Geneva. If you've got unfair and conflict insensitive approaches to natural resources, the Geneva Water Hub's working on really interesting issues there. Poorly planned urbanization and the inequalities that arise around that, you've got the Geneva Cities Hub, great person from UN Habitat. Um, poor management of displaced populations, you've got actors like IOM and UNHCR dealing with that. So I think as we think about the lead up to the summit of the future, I think one of the key questions will be how can the summit process be an accelerator for the SDGs and a decelerator on inequality? And those experiences from Geneva where the rubber really hits the road, I think could offer some really interesting models for how the summit might take up some real practice of addressing inequality. And it's certainly at the heart of, I think, some of the reform ideas for the PVC as well to, to make them more of a, an inequality decelerator. Fifth, um, I think most of, I think the, there were more events on climate security than anything else. And, and that was maybe two years in a row at Geneva Peace Week. Um, and I think 
there's a reason that Geneva Peace Week is filled with so much on climate and, and security. It's because so many of the operational agencies and actors are really dealing with the effects of climate change in a real way. So climate-driven displacement, climate-sensitive peace building, concrete ideas around how climate adaptation and other finance can drive peace positive outcomes. Interpeace has a lot of work on that, um, really interesting. And I think here the climate security mechanism has done a huge amount to advance the climate peace and security agenda in New York. And I think we need to recognize that incredible work. I think the Geneva-based actors can really help build on that and build and bridge it out a bit more. And I think now with, with Switzerland on the Security Council with, with climate as a top priority, now is a really good time to think about that connection and maybe even start thinking about a triangular connection with Nairobi. I was just there and, and UNEP is doing some really interesting work on that as well. Final thought, the 5.5, I think it gets to some of these points around inclusion, but it's really the way things are done in Geneva. I spent most of, most of my UN focused on uh, New York or, or field operations. I'm newish to Geneva. But I think, yes, in Geneva, things are just as fraught and fractured as everywhere else in the world. And the WTOs is as stuck as, as anything that you can find in New York. And no one's expecting the Conference on Disarmament to deliver nuclear disarmament tomorrow. But my, my, my sense is, is that Geneva is less susceptible to the type of deadlock and paralysis that we see in, in the Security Council. Um, for example, the Human Rights Council was the first to pass the human right to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment. The WTO is undergoing a really vibrant process of reform under Ngozi around sustainability, the Villars framework. Um, I think civil society tend to have more access and greater voice in Geneva-based uh, processes than they do here. And I think it's an example of what Natalie was talking about, the kind of inclusion that we need in multilateral processes, modeling potentially something for the summit of the future. And so I think I, I really liked Ambassador Beresfield's re reference to a safe space for inclusive consultations. I think Geneva provides a safe space for many of those civil society actors to, to come into play. And so I think as we think about the summit of the future, some of those Geneva experiences about how to include other actors, how to build coalitions at times of fracture, how to make progress, even when the geopolitics are bad, could be actually some of the most important contributions that Geneva Peace Week can make to New York. I, I really like Zaid's point. I'm not sure if everyone in the room agrees with it, actually, that Geneva is more authentically the UN than New York. I, I tend to agree with it. Um, but I think that word authenticity, if the sum of the future is going to be a success, it's going to have to have a very high degree of authenticity and legitimacy and inclusion if it's going to succeed. And I think it will need a lot of positive and constructive energy to advance the kind of interesting ideas that Ambassador Simonovich put forward, a lot of optimism uh, if we're going to overcome this sense of paralysis. And I think actually that the experiences from Geneva may be able to inject some of that constructive, positive optimism into an otherwise pretty dismal feeling around many of the geopolitical issues today. So thank you for letting me kind of riff on Geneva Peace Week. Um, I'm really very happy to be here and very grateful to Switzerland for supporting this initiative. Thank you very much, Adam. The objective is not to have a discussion now. It's just that our objective was to set the scene this morning. Uh, thanks to uh, the speakers uh, at the high-level panel and thanks to Adam as well. And uh, now the, the, our objective, our ambition is indeed to have your views um, and your, the point of view of uh, New York practitioners in discussing with the Geneva-based uh, practitioners on these issues that we have highlighted for the whole program. Um, so we will, um, after the break, the coffee break, we will talk about the new agenda for peace. Uh, we will talk about um, how to harness technologies to build a better future, how to address climate change indeed through just transi transitions. As you said, uh, Adam, this was very high on our agenda in, in, in Geneva. How also to promote human rights and inclusive societies, the inclusion, the importance of inclusion. And last but not least, um, how really to um, navigate this new uh, potential of AI technology and how to um, harness the complementarities between New York and Geneva on this particular topic of AI. With that, uh, let me um, thank you all for participating to this very first session. There is a coffee break, and then I look forward to seeing you to the next session. Great, thanks.